Hi, I'm Mohamed Bukhari. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Rheumatology, and I'm very pleased to be presenting this roundtable discussion on the uh, more recent BSR nice credit, um, myositis guidelines. I'm just going to go around the table, the virtual table, of course, and I'll get everybody to introduce themselves, starting with Professor Chinoy. Hi, Marwan. Um, I'm Hector Chinoy. I'm a Professor of Rheumatology at the University of Manchester and an honorary consultant rheumatologist at Salted Royal Hospital. I'm uh, Alex Aldroyd. I'm a, uh, a NIHR academic clinical lecturer and I'm a, a rheumatology specialist trainee based at the uh, University of Manchester. Hello, I'm Lisa McCann. I'm a consultant paediatric rheumatologist at Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool. Hello there, I'm James Lillica. I'm a consultant neurologist at uh, Salford Royal Hospital um, and also uh, honorary uh, senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. I'm Phoebe Rush and I am a juvenile vascular myositis patient and I'm also a junior doctor in Liverpool. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll start the, our discussions really. Um, so let's start with James. So could you please give a brief summary of the guideline? Why, is, why it's needed and what it contains? Yeah, thanks, Marwan. Uh, so this is a culmination of, of several years' work now, and and I think what we what we all agreed right from the outset is that the care of patients with myositis has been hampered by the lack of good quality evidence uh, to help guide our treatment decisions. So uh, we we brought together a group of professionals uh, as well as patients from throughout the UK to really work on this problem, um, sift through all the evidence that's that's available to us try and uh, identify the, uh, the high quality evidence and pull it together and really agree uh, between us on um, some important points of best practice around the treatment of myositis. And, and it really does focus on practical advice and guidance around the treatment of the condition rather than its diagnosis. But we did take quite a broad scope. So it doesn't just cover the treatment of the muscle disease. It also includes the skin disease, also includes joint disease, what to do uh, if there's respiratory involvement, um, what to do if your patient becomes pregnant or is breastfeeding. So it's quite wide ranging, but does focus on those practical elements of treatment. And, and as you say, I think this is really important. It's the first guideline of its kind. It follows a very rigorous process of production to make sure that it's uh, as unbiased as possible. And I think it's gonna be a really useful uh, resource for not only professionals, but also patients um, uh, 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 in the future. Okay, and is there an international uh, element to it as well? No, uh, the, the, uh, this is a, a, a UK produced uh, guideline. Um, we, 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 we do have uh, representation from the different nations within the UK, um, but, but it's not, uh, not international in that sense. And there will be a focus um, inevitably on um, uh, guideline, I guess, guidance that's tailored towards treatment within the NHS. But we do take into account evidence from the literature as a whole and produced from uh, all countries. Um, but no, it's, it's a UK focused uh, uh, guideline committee uh, and a UK focused publication. And what could it be used though for, by international readership? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, notwithstanding potentially some of the, uh, the limitations of it being focused towards UK practice, I think there'll be some really useful um, advice and guidance around treating patients with myositis across the globe. Okay, thank you. Um, so the guideline provides a recommendation with paediatric and adult specific recommendations. So why was this done? How can this benefit patients, Lisa? So this is the first BSR guideline that spans the age range from paediatric across to adult age groups. And I think our group are incredibly proud of that fact. Um, and I know other guidance groups are, are going along the same lines now. I think it's crucial. Um, there, whilst there are many similarities in the paediatric onset disease and adult onset disease, there are also distinct differences. And an example of that is the lack of cancer associated myositis in juvenile onset disease that really needs to be clear within guidelines. Uh, there's other things that are different between children and adult onset disease, including increased risk of of calcium deposits in children compared to adults and many other features. So I think it's really important that healthcare professionals are aware of that. And also that patients or parents or their carers that, are that might come across these guidelines and read them are also really clear about these differences. So I think it's absolutely crucial 
that it did include paediatrics and adolescent and adult within the same guideline. And I think it's a good idea that we really do have a, a, a transitional element to it as well. Is, was that addressed in the guideline? Absolutely. We, we didn't um, address transition specifically, but we did try to cover um, topics relevant to transitional services. And I think this is a key thing that comes up time and time again when we talk to young people in our focus groups that have transitioned from paediatric to adult services and all the difficulties that they have kind of come across. And I think we can't underestimate for young people the the challenges of getting a chronic disease potentially during their formative years and the long-term impact that that can have on their well-being, their psychological health, their employment prospects, their education. And so there are a lot of issues that adult rheumatologists need to be aware of um, that are very, very re relevant to transitional care. Thank you. Alice, can you briefly describe the process behind the evidence collation and how the recommendations were formed? Yeah, sure. So um, the, we, we followed the process of the, that the BSR set out in um, collating evidence for guideline um, and recommendation formation. I'm not going to go into loads of detail about that, um, but I suppose in summary, uh, a systematic review is carried out, and this is carried out by the, uh, the team at uh, King's College London. And um, the, once we had all of the research papers together, these were all reviewed, we then aimed to draw out all of the evidence from there. Once we've done that, we formed some draft uh, recommendations. And then with a expert group from people across the UK, uh, we um, amended these recommendations um, and refined them. Um, the, the whole process is approved by NICE. Uh, and um, if anyone wants any more details, they can have a look at the full manuscript and also any of the supporting documents as well. So the National Institute for Healthcare and Clinical Excellence in the UK, which is our regulate, which is regulates the and rations things, is very approving of the whole process. So it's a fairly rigorous one. Yeah. Um, do you, would you would you because of the time it takes? Would you suggest that it might be able to take in extra evidence after the time cut up, or was it very rigorous of of where you got the evidence from? Yeah. So um, the we. Um, all, all of the data we, or so all of the papers that we included was up until October 2020. Um, we didn't include any evidence after that. You know, we, we need to make a cutoff point somewhere, and obviously any further evidence that's come out after that we can't, we couldn't use to form the recommendations. Obviously when we come to review the guideline again in the future, any new uh, evidence that comes through can be um, assimilated as well. Um, it's also important to say that the uh, appropriately the BSR process um, states that we have to form recommendations on evidence. We can't just form a consensus re recommendation that isn't based on evidence. And this 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 um, means that there are some areas that we weren't able to form recommendations on. Um, there's some recommendations that we couldn't be completely precise on because there wasn't evidence. But this has actually been a great opportunity to identify the gaps in evidence and form research agendas for the future. Okay, right. So this is a question to both Hector and Lisa. Uh, you, know, can, uh, you know, what recommendations relating to medications do you think are most relevant? So what will the general uh, or pediatric rheumatologists be taking from this? What's, what's new to them? Let's start off with uh, Lisa, ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. So I think um, most children with juvenile dermatomyositis are treated within specialist centres and so that the medicines will be judged and prescribed by paediatric rheumatologists, but many of our, our general paediatric colleagues or other healthcare professionals will be involved in shared care of those patients. So I think increasing knowledge for them of the type of medicines that these patients might be on is, is useful. I think another key message within the guideline, particularly in paediatrics, but I'm sure it's also relevant in adult onset disease, is a key message that early aggressive treatment is needed and needs to a better outlook. So we would be very keen for people to recognize the disease, to contact us if they're concerned about the possibility of dermatomyositis, to contact us if they're concerned that a patient may be flaring, so that we can treat appropriately and get the disease under control to give the best possible outlook for individual patients. 
Okay. How about adult sector? What will what's new? What's what will a rheumatologist take from these? What we've attempted to do, Marwen, is is provide some standardised guidance for our colleagues, and and to keep it fairly simple and straightforward. We all know that we have to use high doses of steroids in patients with inflammatory myopathy, and we've outlined the dosing ranging between 0.5 and 1 milligram per kilogram per day. So that's usually 40 to 60 milligrams a day. We've advocated um, the use of intravenous steroids um, in, in certain situations if there's reduced absorption of, of the tablets. Knowing what the, the lack of evidence base for adult disease, we're still able to provide guidance on the use of disease-modifying drugs, immunosuppressives, and we've outlined um, which drugs uh, should be used in adult-specific disease as well. We've gone on to make recommendations for the use of rituximab as, as uh, second, third-line therapy, and, and also uh, situations where IV immunoglobulin will be necessary as well. Um, and abatacept is, is another treatment consideration for biologics. So really it's a, a stepwise recommendation process that will provide some standardization for our rheumatology colleagues dealing with myositis, Marwan. Okay, so one last thing. It, have you created an audit tool that will be going with it so people can audit their, their, how they manage myositis? Yes, the, 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 there is an audit tool um, and We've already uh, provided the, um, the specific uh, questions that, that should be associated with, with the audit so that people can assess uh, their own practice and whether they're adhering to the guidelines. Lisa, I think you wanted to add something there. Yeah, and I was just going to say that the audit tool also includes, um, it's a simple checklist, but it also includes areas where it's not applicable to to certain patient groups. So there's some aspects of the guideline that's not applicable to pediatrics or, or to adults. And that's clear within the audit tool as well. So it, hopefully it will be easy to use. Okay. okay, Hector, the guideline addresses a number of biologics. You've mentioned quite a few of them. And do you think this will impact clinical practice? Will, will people have to go to centers of excellence to get these biologics? Or will, do you think that they'll be adopted because they're nice indoors that people can give, for example, a batacept and rituximab within the regions? I think one of the most important things about the guidelines, Marwan, is it provides um, awareness to the general rheumatology um, audience, other people reading these guidelines, so they'll, they'll know for definite which biologics are recommended in myositis, namely rituximab and a batacept. Um, in terms of the availability of the drugs, as you're aware, in England, we have restrictions whereby uh, drugs endorsed by NHS England policies should be given in specialist centres. Um, but there is flexibility there, Marwan. So um, as long as uh, a, an MDT discussion has taken place with the specialist centre, the drugs can often be given locally, making it more convenient for patients who would otherwise have to travel large geographical distances to get to the specialist centers. And there's just the issue of a recharge where the funding goes to the specialist center and just need, they need to reimburse, um, be reimbursing the, um, the local centers. Okay, and that's obviously a very UK based uh, answer and uh, yeah. everywhere else will have, a diff will have a different way of reimbursement. Thank you. We have an additional issue in pediatrics. So some of the, Commission guidance, for example, for rituximab is for adults only. And within NHS commissioning, we're allowed to use that in children under certain regulations, including them being post-pubertal. So we do struggle with, with children kind of younger than usually the 12 is kind of the cutoff, but we can struggle with access to those medications at a younger age. And it doesn't quite fit with the evidence because the rituximab trial included children. Thank you. Next is a question for Alex. Uh, the guidelines provide recommendations related to management of myositis related ILD. Can you please summarize these and uh, how will they impact practice? Yeah, so, um, so myositis related ILD, it's, um, 
it's one of those con one of those disease manifestations that can have a big impact on patients. And you know, in general, we see the sort of the acute, early, severe sort of form, so the rapidly progressive form. And we also see the the long term chronic form as well. And for adults, we've been able to form treatment recommendations on both the rapidly progressive and the chronic form. So I won't go into great detail, but we've provided recommendations on the use of steroids, DMARDs such as cyclosporin and, and tacrolimus, and also cyclophosphamide and rituximab as well. Um, so this can help the uh, anyone helping a patient who's got myositis related ILD, be they a rheumatologist, neurologist, or a respiratory physician, um, deciding which drugs to use and when for patients as well. Now, it's really important to say that um, there just was not at all uh, enough evidence to form treatment recommendations for children with uh, myositis related ILD. And this is obviously a big gap in the evidence base that um, it's really important to address in the future. Uh, we've also provided some practical recommendations about how to screen for and assess for um, ILD in um, patients of all age groups as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, exercises are quite important in managing myositis. Um, what should clinicians advise the patients regarding exercise and how can this give some benefit? Thank you, Marlon. So I think increasingly we realise the importance of exercise. So, so exercise is, is safe, but also a really useful and effective adjunctive treatment along with medications to improve muscle strength, cardiorespiratory fit, and also actually health related quality of life. So it is a, a key thing that we need to include in, in our management of patients with dermatomyositis of, of all ages. When we talk to young people that we look after, uh, they tell us that we can't just tell them to do exercise, we need to tell them how to do exercise in a, in a practical way. And I think that's really where our multidisciplinary team come in. So with the help of our physiotherapists and occupational therapists, they can give very structured exercise programs to help children, young people and adults um, with, with exercise when they've got their disease. As young people get older, they often say that even then they can benefit from a, additional kind of ways of, of helping them with their exercise. So for example, health coaching programs that may be signposted to them by GP surgeries. And I don't know whether Phoebe has any other, any other things that she would like to add to this, because I think it, it is so essential that we get young people and adults doing exercise with this disease. Um, I agree with you with getting involved with the MDT. Um, I was also wondering as well, sort of phrasing it as a, this is part of the treatment plan. It's not a Oh, and at the end, can you do some exercise as well? Sort of then people, I take my medicine and I do my exercise, make it sort of part of the plan and maybe trying to put together things like videos. I guess in lockdown, a lot of people have done gym programs online. So then that can appeal to a lot of different levels. And if you aren't able to make it to a physio and with sort of resources, being a bit scarce with these things, that could be a good way for people to do that at home. And if they do visit specialist centres, they don't have to travel a long way to exercise. I was wondering. Something like that online might be helpful. Okay, thank you. James, um, let's talk about skin disease. Um, so we provide a number of recommendations in the guidelines about skin disease. Uh, can you summarize these and, and what's the take home message? Yeah, thanks, Marwan. Uh, we, we, we do make a, a few recommendations around skin disease, although I, I would highlight that it is one area where the evidence base is particularly uh, sparse, but we were still able to make some recommendations around um, uh, around the use of rituximab in refractory skin disease, around the use of IVIG in refractory uh, skin disease, and, and the importance of sun avoidance um, and, and using sun, uh, sun cream, etc. One important element that came out, although we had to make a paediatric specific recommendation, was around uh, looking at reduced nail fold capillary density and, and using that as a marker of ongoing skin disease activity and, and integrating that into your treatment decisions. There may be relevance there for adult practice, just the evidence uh, wasn't there in the literature for us to make it a more broad recommendation. And another thing uh, which, I'd, which I'd like to, to highlight as well, in, in, the, in the mental health section of the guideline, we, we highlight the 
the importance of um, uh, you know skin disease is often the most visible part of someone's myositis and, and it can have a significant impact on uh, our patients mental health and quality of life and uh, we just emphasize the importance that that should be addressed as uh, as well and and, and again if, if phoebe has some comments uh, uh, i think that'd be really really helpful and maybe alex can come in and talk about the better quality of life as well within the context of it so phoebe first and alex second yeah, so I think the inclusion of the mental health aspect is really important, obviously sort of as well as the physical parts of it, there's the mental burden of having a chronic disease and then also the impact of medications and things like steroids on mental health. It's really important. Um, I think even just educating patients on that this is a thing and it's okay to find that hard is, is like a good step for them to get in help and offering things like counselling I think could be really helpful for things like this and yeah I think sort of educating people initially is going to be yeah. important. Okay so are there any other elements of mental health Alex that you think you know you've also considered within the guideline? Yeah so, so just, to, just to start you know um, echoing what Phoebe was saying the quality of life and mental well-being uh, aspects of living with myositis is it's a huge priority for any patient groups we talk to and, you know, traditionally as doctors, you know, we focus on the drugs and the medications um, and tend not to address the quality of life and the mental well-being aspect. So, you know, one thing we wanted to do was just to raise the profile of this so that it's routinely considered. Um, the other particular, um, the other areas that we focused on uh, it, that was pediatric spe specific uh, was pain, muscle weakness and poor sleep. Now, we don't have any you know, answers of how to address all of these, but it's one of those things that all of those areas should be addressed and look for. And if there's anything that can be done with medication or managing disease activity, then that, that should obviously be, be considered as well. Um, we, there, there wasn't, there weren't any other particular aspects. And this is obviously an area that um, doesn't have a great evidence base. So again, as I've mentioned before, you know, this is an area that needs a lot more research um, and with, with, with the aim of addressing all of the quality of life and mental well-being aspects that aren't necessarily addressed through medical treatment of the condition. Um, going back to the audit tool actually, um, Lisa, can you, can you, can, do you think that it, this will lead to better myositis management? Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, the idea of, of the guidelines is, is to create a, a minimal standard really, isn't it? And to raise the, the standard of care um, across all age groups. And I think um, the audit tool is just a tool that allows units to assess their practice against national guidance and to make sure that they are considering all aspects of care, which includes access to counselling or psychological services. It includes access to, to physiotherapists, occupational therapists. And I know this sounds very straightforward, but one of um, our, our UK nurses, Polly Livermore, has done some work looking at access to care in paediatrics to psychologists, and, and there is still a postcode lottery, and that's not what we want. You know, we, all patients should be able to access the care that they need. So I think audit tools can be useful to identify gaps in services. I think comparing those gaps against national guidance can help with service development in individual hospitals or individual units. And, um, and so I think it, I, I would hope that this will improve standards of care across the UK and also make it more uniform. We want to avoid that postcode lottery. Let's go through and ask about areas, the gaps. James, where do you think there's been any gaps uh, that you've found? Have you found any big gaping holes in the evidence base that you think should be, should, people should be directed towards? Um, I mean, I think... Um... Uh, as with as with any um, uh, uh, guideline uh, process, you'll you'll come across areas where there's there's some evidence, but it perhaps doesn't meet your standard for inclusion to form a, a full recommendation. And and that was certainly the case here with myositis, where I think uh, you know uh, amongst uh, um, autoimmune rheumatic diseases, I, I think the evidence base is particularly sparse for myositis. Um, one of the major issues is is, is simply around some of some of the um, uh, specifics around, say, the sequencing of different immunosuppressive medications. You know, th there's very little head-to-head -head data of, of the different DMARDs, for example, or um, um, uh, the exact doses or durations of those treatments. So, 
people may read with some frustration around, you know, not being told an exact dose or duration of certain medications and people will have to use their professional judgment in, in that regard. I think the other frustration is, is around some of the uh, more novel treatments, say JAK inhibitor, uh, inhibitors, where there are some uh, case reports or small case series, but not enough uh, evidence to form a formal recommendation as part of this uh, guideline. And then similarly, uh, some of the um, factors we know can be particularly problematic in patients with myositis, uh, say um, the risk of cancer or the risk of cardiovascular involvement. We, we managed to make some recommendations about how you might screen for those, uh, those problems, but the exact method that you want to use locally or how often you should do it in those very specific terms, we've not been able to really drill down into. Uh, we're only able to make quite broad recommendations. So uh, I think this guideline in many ways is a very important starting point. Um, and we've been able to identify some gaps in the literature and focus uh, our future research to try and fill them. And I'm, and I'm sure that in coming years, uh, there'll be an update to this guideline, which uh, fills some of those holes. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll look forward to producing that as a team again, uh, amongst the uh, adult and pediatric uh, teams involved here. Okay, well, finally a question to all of you. Um, bone density estimation is quite an interesting science because there's a lot to, to it. So these are patients who are A, given steroids, and B, have got muscle replaced with fat. Do you think the definition of, of, of poor bone health in your populations should be looked at in a bit more detail going forward? So um, the, the, you know, obviously a lot of our patients with myositis have, you know, chronic condition, they have long-term steroid use, and obviously their muscles are impacted. So they have lots of risk factors for osteoporosis. The small number of studies we identified uh, showed that osteoporosis was increased, uh, there was an increased risk of osteoporosis and fractures in people with myositis. So it's vitally important that clinicians screen for osteoporosis, consider it early as well, and take steps to reduce the risk of a fragility fracture. And this goes, you know, all the way from, you know, children who, re who are receiving steroids as well, you know, ensuring adequate exercise, calcium, vitamin D intake as well. Um, there obviously is, you know, a, an area, you know, there obviously is a need for specific osteoporosis risk and management research in people with, with myositis. And we very much welcome that when we come to produce the next uh, iteration of the guideline. And in fact, maybe the T-scores the T that we're using in adults and, and Z-scores that we're using in children might not be the right, might not be the right one. The threshold might be different. So I think should highlight, that should be highlighted. Sure. Um, okay, so any other areas that you can all see that we're going to be having more, rec more, more recommendations to look for? Any other, any other parts? Any new evidence that you think will be coming through? So I, I can take that one, Marwan. James has already alluded to the use of JAK inhibitors, and we were actually in the process of, of uh, carrying out a JAK inhibitor trial in, in the UK. There's, there's JAK inhibitor studies going on in, in other countries as well. It's looking like a very promising treatment for the use of calcinosis as well. And so for the first time, we may actually have uh, a, a drug that uh, that can help um, our patients who have these troublesome lesions, um, both adults and children. There's increasing evidence now, um, up-to-date evidence for the use of IVIG, and this didn't make this this current guidelines the cutoff date, um, but it definitely adds to the historical evidence base for the use of IVIG in uh, steroid-resistant patients. So, you know, these are just two examples of, of drugs that will help to reduce the steroid burden in, in our patients, um, because myositis, amongst other rheumatic diseases, we're using the most amount of steroids in, in, in these patients. And as you say, in patients who already have underlying weakness. So we're giving a drug for muscle weakness that in the longer term um, can, can cause uh, problems with weakness as well. I'd, I'd like to think we'd have more more personalised based treatment, but I don't know whether that that's going to be ready in time for the for the next guidelines. 
um, but, but antibody stratification is proving to be very useful. What we're increasingly learning now is, is certain combinations of antibodies can predict a certain prognosis as well. So it could be in the future that we have a whole panel of combinations of, of, of myositis antibodies that tell us something about the patient and what they're going to respond to in terms of treatment and their prognosis as well. So it's, it's a great time for myositis. We've finally got some guidelines and there's, there's clinical trials happening in, in this rare disease. So um, it, it's, um, there may well be one or two licensed drugs available as well for the next um for the next version of the guidelines um one final I would, oh, sorry can i just add something to that yes, so by I, all means. I, I agree 100 percent with hector of course um i think coming very much from a pediatric perspective i would love all trials of myositis to include children it still doesn't happen um so we will continue to have this dichotomy of of you know evidence available in adults and not available in young people, it's absolutely key that all future trials include children and young people that are patients and, and the parents that care for them want that. So I think that's really important. I think the other thing we really struggle with, and I hope we'll get more evidence for this in the future, is which drug is better. There's, there's very few trials that, that compare one drug to another. Um, in the pediatric cohort, we were able to use the PRINTO study, which compared steroids alone with, against steroid and methotrexate and steroid and cyclosporin, but that really is the exception. So it would be nice to have more on that. And it would also be really important to be able to define drugs for specific complications. So calcinosis as Hector's mentioned, but also interstitial lung disease or um, these rare complications that can be particularly difficult in children to define which treatment is better. Right, so Phoebe, um, this is from the patient perspective. Can you just let us know what do you think about the guidelines and uh, how do you think this will affect patients going forward? Um, from looking at the guidelines, I think they have a really wide scope, which is encouraging to see as a patient. I was quite surprised with some of the things that are included actually in a good way. So um, things like the mental health aspects. And I think really they're just a good way of showing that we or that healthcare professionals acknowledge that patients are all out there living busy lives um, and we're going on to have children and working and acknowledging that our mental health will be affected and that we're thinking about those things rather than just thinking what medications can we give to patients um, and also acknowledging like the differences between patients so the aspect about ethnic um, differences as well I thought was really interesting. Okay, and you think though, you know, taking this to a, to an international audience, that you know, if, if you don't have access to psychology, etc., in your country, would it be something that you would encourage, you know, other patient groups across the world to actually take on board? So, would it be something that you would want to publicise through the PARI network, for example, with Eula? Yeah, I definitely think that whatever resources are available for different people, it's always important to acknowledge, and then we can just work with what we've got sort of resource base really. And then also there's no problem with sort of trying to better places um, just because we haven't got resources doesn't mean we can't try to make more. So I think it'd be a good thing to encourage. Um, and if we can sort of lead the way with that, I think that would definitely be a good thing to do. And do you think you'd want to publicize these guidelines to other patient networks across across the globe? Are there any connections between patient networks here in the UK where this was developed and other patient networks in the US or Europe, etc? I think when you get down to sort of like the basic principles of the guidelines, that's the same for everywhere, I imagine, and sort of young people all over the world will relate to these really. And obviously we've got cultural differences and like we say, sort of healthcare differences, but that feeling of being diagnosed, being on medication from a young age, I think will affect everyone. Um, and sort of encouraging these conversations um, is always beneficial. Okay, so hopefully you, you feel that these will actually help empower the patient populations because we don't have that many patient groups around. Um, how well do you think it will be taken up by, by the local authorities that if you go as a patient voice and say that we demand to have better access to services locally 
I think by having these in a guideline, it does all, almost back it. I think, like we mentioned previously with things like mental health and exercise, making that part of a clinician's management plan does almost back that and say this is worth funding because we found evidence-based research that means that this is worth looking into. It isn't just an addition or something patients have to go out and seek themselves. We, ha we have backing for it, really, and I think that's something patients will appreciate and then also sort of highest external stakeholders and people like that. Okay, so as a patient, lastly, what area do you think should have been covered in the guide? What you would like to see covered in the guidelines? I mean, they didn't have if they didn't have the evidence, they can put it in. But is there anything you feel you know if they only had the evidence for that, that would have made my life easy? Um, I think the thing I think would be useful to cover is maybe going into a little bit more depth about the way it will affect people of different ages because I always think this with pediatrics a four-year-old is very different to a 16 year old and obviously it will affect the treatment that we get but also the things that we're going through in life and trying to help a younger children with mental health or exercise will differ very much to that so I think obviously at the moment we've just sort of really acknowledged the areas that we're focusing on and I think to look into that and give recommendations to different groups would be really helpful within the paediatric population. Okay well thank you very much for from the patient point of view and I think uh, that's quite a good discussion regarding it and we look forward for everybody reading it and it being, uh, being used as an exemplar for treating inflammatory muscle disease. Uh, and thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you. Thanks, Marwan.